And with that, I would like to introduce your, our presenter for the evening, Deborah Smith. Welcome, Deb. Thanks, Kevin. All good? All good. We're ready to go. We can... Well, hello, everyone. It's nice to actually see some familiar faces coming up. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, my camera's in front of the video stream, but... Uh, yeah, we will we'll get going. So let me just minimize that so I can't see that much. Okay. Yeah, talking about linking music literacy with music learning in the instrumental lesson. So says it all really. I'm kind of making an assumption tonight. I'm making an assumption that most of you think of music as a language. And if you don't, you would like to. For those of you who are not sure, in the chat, I've just posted a link to the first video, the language of music video. So these videos are ones that I've made over the years um, to help support what I believe music is and how it should be taught. So as with all of these, um, these are my opinions. These are um, tried and true methods over the years of teaching many, many, many students and teachers. Um, but obviously the best way to teach anything is to take um, what you learn from anyone and turn it into your own. So this video is all about why I teach music as a language, why music is considered a language, um, and hopefully it helps just settle that kind of thinking that you might be going through at the moment. The link to the second video is this one about singing and tonic sulfur. Uh, those of you who know me and have seen me talk before will know that this, the alphabet I use, the spelling form that I use is tonic sulfur. Now I use this for many, many reasons and this video tells you some of them. And I'm always happy to defend what I do to anyone who's more interested and wants to give me a call and have a chat. Um, but basically, in my many, many years of teaching, I have tried many things and I keep coming back to tonic sulfur. It was not what I was taught. I was taught very traditionally. I discovered tonic sulfur when I first began to teach and it was through me trying to work out the best way to help students who just didn't get it. Um, particularly thinking about things like transcriptions, melodic transcriptions, rhythmic transcriptions, just having that depth of knowledge of music, um, of the language of music. And that was when I stumbled across um, the Kodai method. Now, I do not count myself as a Kodai teacher. I count myself as a music literacy teacher. I do use a lot of the tools of Kodai because that's what he was. And that's how I discovered tonic sulfur. And tonic sulfur for me, works best because it was designed to be sung so it's pleasant to sing it helps sing in tune the the positioning of the vowels when we sing them helps us actually sing in tune correctly um, it also gives you a lot of information about every note you sing it helps you and know it well it's, it's formative assessment for you as a teacher because if a student sings something in solfa you actually know what they know about the notes and we'll talk a bit more about that later. Now singing. Singing is something that those of us who are not singers, and I very much include myself in that group, um, struggle with. And that's partly because we're not a singing culture. In Australia, um, people who sing, if they don't go on Australian Idol or The Voice, then it's not cool, it's corny, it's embarrassing, it's whatever. Um, so one of the very first things I tell my students, regardless of whether it's in class or instrumental lessons, is please leave cool at the door. I am not cool. I do not try to be cool. You are not allowed to be cool in my lessons either. I'm not recording you. We're being recorded now and I'm quite happy to not be cool. But it's not about being cool. It's about learning the language of music. Um, for many of us, and I have to admit, admit to being one of these, when I taught a lot of instrumental music, which was before I finished my degree um, and started classroom music teaching, the only time my students and I sang was when we were getting ready for a practical AMEB exam, where they had to sing things 
which actually weren't that useful anyway. But of course, I was embarrassed. They were embarrassed because singing wasn't part of what we did. I tell you what, if I taught those kids again now, I think they would just be so much better than they were when I taught them way back when because of the research and the experience that I've had and the way that I've actually spent so much time thinking about how to help people who can't just do it. And I was one of the lucky ones at school. I could just do it. I didn't have sulfur. I didn't have numbers. I didn't use anything. I just could hear this stuff. So, and that's just luck. That's not training. Probably 90% of our students can't. So that's what this is for. So singing is not to be a singer. Singing is because that is how I speak the language of music. So if you want more convincing, the Vimeo uh, link is there and in the chat. Okay, one of my main goals as a music teacher is to help my students become musically literate in the same way as a language teacher helps their students become literate in the language they're being taught. So you need to have goals as an instrumental teacher about what it is you want to teach your students. Now, I've actually been doing some lecturing at Monash online um, for their Bachelor of Music Instrumental teaching stream. And it's been really interesting because I've challenged them and I've asked them to stop thinking of themselves as a flute teacher and start thinking of themselves as a music teacher. And to put, and in fact, something I was going to put in, but it sort of skipped out of the, the talk I'm giving you tonight is yours might be the only musical instruction these kids ever get. You cannot assume that they get good quality music education in the classroom. You cannot assume that the choir at their school is any more than just singing songs. You can't even assume that they have any musical experience because the school they go to might not offer anything at all. So I'll just say that phrase again. Yours might be the only music education these kids ever get. And when you think of it like that, are you happy for them to have only learnt the instrument? And I'm including voice as an instrument, so please, I'm not going to keep saying instrument and vocal. We're all in together. We teach an instrument, and if it's your voice, that's great. If it's not, that's great too. So I teach music, whether it's in a piano lesson or a clarinet lesson or a classroom music lesson or a choir lesson or an ensemble, I teach music. And I also teach music in a way that no matter what else the kids do, it will allow them to be musically literate as best I can in the time I get. It will allow them to be independent musicians. Now, throughout this tonight, I'm going to tell you what I think that means. You, of course, need to know what you think that means. And this might mean reevaluating what you've done for the last 30 years. It might not. It might be a couple of things that you thought I could add that in, but I'm really happy with the rest of it. And I know as a teacher, as a parent, as a learner myself, that a half hour music lesson is very, very short. But if they know the language of music, then they can take that knowledge and put it on any instrument by being taught the technicalities of that instrument. So if we were lucky enough to have music literacy taught in the classroom, in schools, how easy would your job be as a flute teacher or a guitar teacher? Your students would come to you knowing how to hear and listen and speak and sing and play and perform and read and write with understanding. Your job would then just be, and I don't mean just in a negative way, would just be to teach the instrument. We don't get it that lucky here. So that is my definition of being musically literate. What you can see on your screen is my definition of what I want my students to have when they leave my class or my lesson. And it's with understanding. They're the words that really matter to me. A monkey can copy a couple of notes in a melody and make it sound cool. Well, I don't know if a monkey could make it sound cool, but I could. <laughs> a 
but it's the with understanding that makes us musicians. So some of the tools, and I'm not going to talk about all these tonight because I've got a total of what 60 minutes. Um, but I'm really happy to help if anyone emails me, I get really excited after these things. So some of the tools of music literacy that I use, I need a way to spell my language. You can't teach English without the alphabet. If you teach English without the alphabet, then they won't know how to spell it. They won't know how to read it. They won't know how to write it. They might know how to speak it. That's great, but I don't call that literate. So we need an alphabet. Now, because our language is pitch-based and rhythm-based, I have two. I have the tonic solfa and I have the rhythm names. Now, this is how I spell the notes. I still use letter names. I use tonal names. I use diatonic names. I use every name I can come up with. Sometimes I use numbers. If I'm practicing scale degrees, I will use whatever's necessary, but my alphabet is tonic solfa and rhythm names. In a hearing and audiation, we're going to talk a bit more about later, but basically this is hearing the music in your head. When you read words, if you look at my screen, I'm not reading it to you, I'm paraphrasing. So when you look at my screen, how do you know how those words sound? Where do you hear them? Well, you hear them in your head. Now, because you've been speaking our language for so long, hearing them in your head is automatic. But if you're new to English, then you may even have to still spell out some of the words. You might have to think about them more deeply. You might have to look at the spelling. This is what we want our students to be able to do with music. We want them to be able to look at the notes on the page and know how they sound in their heads. I use what I call immersive listening. It's where we actually listen to get benefit. We listen to others perform pieces we're performing, or we listen to um, others perform in, in you know different pieces or we just listen but we listen in an immersive way we listen in a way that will make us better performers i've blocked all those there because i'm not going to get to those tonight but yes i use games i use movement even in my instrumental lessons now in my instrumental lessons our games aren't the sort of games that you think of when you think of classroom music but they are still games that will highlight things within the pieces they're playing. For example, you can always use a pat -a cake action with your student while they read the rhythm of a couple of bars that they're really struggling with. Now, if you've done any research into um, the way we, our brains work, music is a very, very right and left brain activity. So we actually need everything to be firing across. And the way you get, you, there's lots of little things you can do. You drink water, lots of water, all sorts of, you know, little tricks. But the patter cake action, which let's face it, most of our kids don't do anymore, is incredibly useful for waking up that cross brain thing that goes on that we need when we do music. Music actually requires both sides of our brains. I use hand signs for the tonic so far. Now, I particularly use hand signs for children who aren't great at pitch. I also use hand signs when I ever have anything to do with string players because string players who cannot hear and sing in tune, cannot play in tune. It's a physical impossibility. So we need to get our musicians. And yes, of course, you might say, well, a pianist just plonks a note. There's a lot more to it than that. So the hand signs I use a lot of in my so far work. Conducting. Conducting is functional beat. Your kid who's struggling on piano with the left hand of something, their goal is to be able to conduct with their right while they play the left. Give them it as a challenge. Let them work up to it. Things like this become games for the kids. Composing. I should have written creating actually. Let your students create but give them parameters. I'm a classically trained clarinetist and pianist. If you had asked me to improvise before I started teaching this way, if you had asked me to improvise using my voice in solfa before I learned this way, then I would have probably burst into tears and run out of the room. 
creating is the same in music as it is with the language. And I don't know about you, but I was allowed to start making up sentences as soon as I knew a couple of words. Why don't we get our students to do that too? That should be, and I'm not talking about, I mean, you don't even have to do it in your lesson, but it could be as simple as saying, do you ever sit at the piano and just play? My daughter's 14, she's been learning piano for ages, but she'll often play something and I'll be listening in the background and then I'll say, who wrote that? And she goes, oh, I was just making it up. And that's probably one of the most exciting things because although she's learning to read music, she learns a solfa, she's learning it classically, the fact that she feels comfortable enough just to play with it, whereas the way I was taught was so by the book that that was not encouraged. So let them have fun with it. Memorising, another thing I was terrified of, um, it's so important. It is just so important. All right, so how do we make sure they know this and can function with this in this way? Have a listen. When we give a piece of music to our students, we're giving them a very, very complex piece of notation. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I said earlier, we have a rhythmic language and a pitch based language. Well, this is a perfect example of the sort of thing I could do if I was beginning my cello student, and I don't teach cello, uh, my cello student on this particular piece of music, which is um, the third sonata, cello sonata by Vivaldi, the Largo. So we could have a look at this rhythm and we could read the rhythm names. Ta, tim, ka, tim, ka, ta, ta. If they conducted, it would be even more valuable. Ta, tim, ka, tim, ka, ta, ta. Of course, taking the instrument away means all they're thinking about is the rhythm. So then we could take it a step further and we could ask them to listen to it in a slightly different way. So above um, the, the notes on the staff, you'll see this shorthand. So here's the rhythm that we just read through and here's the solfa. Now, if you just gave them the piece of music and they started playing it, there's no conscious awareness of what's going on in the music tonally, harmonically, in any way, shape or form. Instead, letting them listen to it and they don't have to get all the notes that's not what the point of this is i'm not trying to get them to be able to transcribe i'm trying to give them a deeper understanding of the music that they're going to play so la la do ti la mi mi now if your solfa is good the moment you sing that there's so much information there we know it's beginning on the tonic of a minor key the first interval, la, la, is an octave. Now, I don't know about cellists, but I know on a lot of instruments, that's an interval that it, well, it needs to be perfectly in tune and it can sometimes be challenging. By singing it, being aware of it being an octave is such a simple, obvious thing to those of us who are musicians. To our students, it might not be that clear. What about this? La, do, ti, la. Well, it's just the first three notes of the minor scale, but it's a minor third, la, do. So their awareness of that, especially in this very major world we live in, is a really valuable thing. Mi, mi, well, that's the dominant in a minor key. So we could go on and look through this from a solfa perspective. 
the solfa simply gives them the relationships between the notes. So when I know me in a minor key, I know it's a dominant. If I sing la, it's the tonic. If I sing do, it's the mediant. We could talk about things like la, do, mi, outlining the tonic triad. Chances are underneath all of these notes, we're going to have the tonic triad. Now, something that I look back on and I'm horrified with, but there would have been no other way for me to have done it when I did all my exams. I vividly remember for my Amos paying someone to analyze the music that I then learned what they wrote on my score so that if the examiner asked me a question, I could answer them, you know, on the spot. Now, looking back, that is so sad that I didn't realize how important it was that my teachers didn't realize how important it was and that I missed that next level of understanding that if I had had the skills and knowledge, I could have gone through the music myself or gone through it with the person who was analyzing it for me and understood things like, look at this. This is such a good use of the melodic minor. La, um, what are we? Me. I'm singing out of tune, but this um, C, Fi, Mi, Mi, Fi, Si, La, I know I've gone out of key. This is the descending melodic, sorry, it's the ascending melodic minor, but used in a descending phrase. Now that's actually really important because a lot of our kids never connect that the notes in a melodic minor scale are only that way to make the scale logical. In music, we can do whatever we want with those notes. And that's exactly what Vivaldi did right here. Deborah? Yes. Can I just ask you one question? When you paid this person to do this analysis for you, right, at that stage in your music practice, mm -hmm. were you doing any composing or any improvising? No. I was... To, to uh, me, that's the, that's the answer. Yeah, I know. It, it's But with understanding. Yeah, 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 yeah. Improvising with understanding. So no, I was very much so I think I was only 17. I was still at school. Um, and you know, I was a really, really good clarinetist. Right, right. But because I found with my students, um, I'm, I'm a guitar teacher. Yeah. And I find that embedding that yeah. em embedding the, the actual the, 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 the composition part and, and the improvising part, and you know, make something up in other yeah. words, you yeah. know, and but then here in the that particular key, yeah, or with that here, rhythm, the, here yeah. are the tools to do it, creates a need to understand it. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. No, yeah. that's, that's all part of, of what we're talking about. And as long yeah. as everything's done with understanding, yeah, then absolutely, I know mm. it wouldn't have been awesome. But I mean, mm. obviously, you know, we're taught how we're taught. And, and I look yeah. back and think it was sad, maybe one day I'll pull out all my old Amos music and analyze it myself and see if they were yeah. wrong <laughs> and i've i've studied um classical guitar and i've studied jazz guitar mm -hmm. right and the, the 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 whole thing about jazz guitar is that you need to engage with this stuff to play the idiom yeah the idiom um demands you to understand it yeah. otherwise you know you're going to be playing a whole lot of bad notes on the bandstand <laughs> Very, very true. In Thank real you. time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in real time. So, <laughs> yes, what you see on your screen now is just the rest, well, the rest of this first section. And I want to show you how now I see things like this and how now my students see things like this. We would notice, yes, the raised sixth and the raised seventh here. And then we would notice um, this focus around C almost. So we see instead of now we know with nothing in the key signature, um, it could be C major or A minor, but it begins on that really strong la, la, do, ti, la. So a very strong recognition of tonality right from the start, we're in minor. But then here, we start to have this C coming back all the time, touch of an A again. But here, 
we get the octave again. And if they sang this, they would see it and hear it so realistically. You have the octave and then the first three notes of the scale, but this time we're in the relative major. But then you might look on and, and look, it's exactly the same, but in the relative major as our opening was, we even with our dominant, so we've got our imperfect cadence, but then here we get this E flat coming in, but we're still focused around the C. Now, those of us again, who are musically trained know that another common key, so um, relative major, relative minor, tonic minor. So he's gone from A major to C, sorry, A minor, to its relative major C major, to its tonic minor of C minor. And that's where he's ended here. And of course, we can see this note is the raised seventh because in C minor, we would have a B flat. So we've got the pull of this leading note. As your students get more advanced, you can start extrapolating the harmonies that might work. So don't worry about what Valdi thought. What harmonies would you put here? What chords might you put with this? Now, now I'm heading off now into the area that obviously as an instrumental teacher with half an hour and you're a cello, cello teacher, trying to talk about harmony is, it feels like it's taking up valuable time and it is, but it gives back more than it takes. And that's the same with a lot of this stuff. A lot of the time you could spend half the lesson looking at it, listening to it, singing it, thinking about it, talking about it. By the time they pick up their instrument, it's just the fingering and the bowing. Because you've done so much, it's already in their head. And I'm not saying you always start with what you hear because of course sight reading is the reverse. But for now, this is so there's two different approaches to learning new music, make sure you do both. But this approach gives them such a more in-depth understanding of the notes on the page. So I apologize for the bad quality of this, um, but this is something that I wish I'd been asked to look at more as a clarinetist. Now I was a pianist and I, I've got my amas on my piano as well. So a good high level pianist, I could have understood this stuff, but no one ever thought it was important enough for me as a clarinetist to really understand what was going on underneath. So I actually, for this one, I tried to find the figured bass. I would have loved to have found um, the actual continuo part, which would have just been a bass line and the numbers above it, because I, I will never forget. So having done my whole degree, my Bachelor of Music, I never really understood figured bass, even though I was a keyboard player. I know that sounds really dumb, but it was just never explained to me as simply as Do is one, me is three, so is five. It was just never, and I never sang it. It was always something on the page. I wish someone had. So looking at the accompaniment part gives you a whole nother level of understanding of what's going on above. And of course, if like this piece, there are other arrangements and things, well then why not have a look at these because these give you other insight as well. Have a listen. Um, actually, no, let me skip through that because I want to take it to another level of music literacy now. A lot of people think that music literacy is just the notes on the page. To me, music literacy is understanding as much as possible about the notes on the page and not just the black dots. This was written by Vivaldi, so that has a lot of implications. So, but I don't have to, I don't have to think about those. I don't have to play with those implications, but understanding them will help me choose how I want to play this. Now, this is something else that I don't think I ever really thought about very deeply until quite recently when I wrote the decoding soundbook that some of you will have seen. The decoding soundbook is all about performance analysis. And obviously back in my day, if you wanted to hear someone else play it, you had to go to a concert or buy a record. <laughs> so it wasn't like today where we have free Spotify. And if you put in the Mozart clarinet quintet, you will get 
15 million different versions of it for you to listen to and think about. But I would, th I think that even if I had that when I was a performer, oh, sorry, I wouldn't have used it in the way that we can now or we can think about it now. So I want to now have a think about the expressive elements of music and there's a crossover with BCE here if you teach BCE students. But what's happened for me personally is my VCE students being forced to do this has made me realize how incredibly valuable this other level of understanding of the notes is. So this now is not so much for your beginners and things, but I would strongly recommend you start talking about things as soon as possible, because we all know as musicians, as music teachers, that you can go to a concert where the performer is technically brilliant there are no wrong notes, there is nothing wrong with the performance, but you can leave being left cold. You can also go to a performance, and I will never forget a performance of the Copeland Clarinet Concerto, which is my favourite clarinet work, in the Brisbane City Town Hall, which has the worst acoustics ever, performed by, um, I can't even remember his name now, it's gone completely. Anyway, he was my hero when I was a clarinetist. And if you know the um, Copeland, the last note is the highest and it's a killer and he missed it. And I didn't care. It was just, uh, I think I was like 16 and I have, I will remember every single bit about that night. And if anything, the fact that he actually was human and made a wrong note right at the end, like I would have done, made it so much re more real. But what made that performance stand out to me was just the way he played it was he'd obviously thought about every single note and what he wanted to convey with every single note he played. And I felt every single note he played to me. And I'm sure he played other wrong notes. I hadn't played it by then, so I didn't know it as well as I perhaps do now. But to me, that you know, it almost brings tears to my eyes now. So how much of a good performance is the notes and how much is the understanding, the thought, the, the, the planning behind how we're going to play it. So that's what I want to talk for a bit now. So we need to think about this in terms of the elements of music that we can change as performers. Now, if we're classical musicians, Obviously, that is quite limited in one sense. The notes are written, they're on the page, the, often the tempo is given, but sometimes not. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but be very careful as a performer and as a teacher about what's an, edit, uh, an editor's mark and a composer's mark. And you don't even have to do the composer's mark. But having that kind of understanding is really important too. For example, do you know Bach for all his cello suites did not ever give a tempo marking? You pick up today's Bach suites and they will have tempo markings. Well, Bach didn't do it. Even on the handwritten copies that his wife made, he did not, she did not put tempo markings. So does that mean tempo is not important or does it mean he wants you to create your own? So this is Vivaldi, who of course was later, but have a listen to these two versions. And I just want you to think about tempo and what the speed they've chosen to play this at does to the mood they create. Here's the first one, which you've heard a little. <laughs> And here's a different version.
you could not get more different if you tried as far as tempo is concerned. You also couldn't get a lot more different as far as the mood they're creating. Now, of course, as musicians, we all know it's not just tempo, but wow, tempo makes such a difference. So instead of thinking about tempo as something we need to choose based on how well we can play the notes, we need to choose tempo based on what we're trying to convey with those notes. And if it's faster than we can play yet, we have to work it up until we can get to that tempo. Now, one of the things that a lot of us instrumental teachers are not great at is technology, and I get that. Um, but Spotify, the free Spotify, it's a web app. Um, don't download the app, just use it on your browser. All I did for that particular exercise was type in Vivaldi Cello Sonata Number no. 3 Largo, and up came this huge long list. Now they weren't all the right piece. And in fact, when that second one started to play, I thought, oh no, wrong one. And by the time he'd, I'd got my mouse to go, he'd gone on and I thought, oh my goodness, it's the same piece. Because he holds that first note for so long. So Spotify is incredible, but you don't even have to do it. Tell your students by next week, I want you to come back with three versions. I want them to be quite different and I want you to have your favorite. And then you talk about why it's their favorite, not because they like it or don't like it, but because the tone color is such and such. Or maybe like when I first listened to those two today, I liked the first one better. But now tonight, I actually think there's a lot in that second one that appeals. Now, yes, it's darker. He does a lot with the, um, articulation and a lot with ornamentation to change it. But I often like I actually think a lot of the slowness is to give the ornamentation space, which the first one doesn't have so much of. Now, obviously, with Vivaldi, with Bach, there are opportunities to make up your mind about a lot of things. But unless you're doing an AMEB exam or something that has to be performed in that exact way, does it really matter if you added some ornamentation to Tchaikovsky? What about if you change the tempo and played it at your own? Who's to say you're wrong? Who's to say Tchaikovsky wouldn't be listening going, oh, I like that, wish I'd thought of that. So music interpretation has to be more flexible, even if we're classical musicians. Obviously, if we're contemporary or jazz musicians, we're encouraged to have our own voice a lot more. So understanding what these different elements of music can do, particularly with things like tone color, articulation, um, it's, you know, phrasing, all these sort of things that aren't set in stone for us that we can come up with is really important. And of course, don't forget the value of them being able to watch someone else perform it. And okay, we're all stuck at home, we can't go anywhere, we can't go to concerts. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty over this. But how lucky are we that we can still do this? <laughs> Okay, so there's a lot in there. And if you are a cello teacher, I'm assuming that's a Baroque bow because it looks quite different. Um, I notice she uses very little vibrato. The, the slurring and the phrasing is really interesting. So completely different again from the other two performances. The use of the harpsichord. I mean, there's just so many things you can talk about with your students because chances are they'll be accompanied by a piano, which is again, gonna be a completely different tone color and support. A piano is going to give you a lot more support harmonically than a harpsichord will and so on. All right, what I like you to do for the next little while 
is just give you a couple of little other ideas or ideas to go along with what we've talked about, but in a few different settings. So I'm sure there's quite a few of you who are piano teachers because there seem to be a lot of us out there. Um, and this is just a little journey exercise that I grabbed a screenshot of off the internet. Um, so not unusual for a student to be performing or practicing something like this. This is the sort of exercise that lends itself to um, sight reading because it's quite straightforward. So you could ask them to play the right hand, play the left hand. Um, it also lends itself to the other way of looking at it. It's probably a little bit simple for that. So I'd probably let them play it first and then start talking about it. The obvious questions, which we all ask all the time, but perhaps not often enough, well, keys it in, C major. How do you know? Nothing in the key signature, the last note, the lowest last note, and of course it's actually down here, but here there's another C. Its tonal center is C. Don't miss that opportunity. When we were looking at the Vivaldi earlier, its tonal center kept changing because it was modulating. If we get hung up on key signatures, if we get hung up on last notes and forget the importance of tonal centers, then we miss the opportunity to pick those modulations and things. This doesn't modulate though. It stays in C. Look, C's at the bottom, G's at the top. Why would G be important? It's the fifth note. What do we call the fifth note? It's the dominant. So the dominant's the second most important note. So this whole thing revolves around the C, which is the tonic and the G, which is the dominant. We have some interesting um, things going on in the top hand. Before we got too far into it, though, I would get them to sing the scale. Now, something that actually horrified me this afternoon when I was looking for these little exercises was the number of PDFs, so free PDFs, which is very nice of people, that had the note names written beneath the notes. And that amazed me. And of course, then I put this up and I realized that I've put all the sulfur here beneath the scale, but that's only because I'm showing you something. This is what my students get if they're lucky. Never, ever, ever, and I'm sure you all don't, but if you write the notes beneath, the names of the notes beneath the notes on the staff, then that is forever what your students will look at. If we want them to actually know that this is C, then we need to take away the crutch of writing C, D, E, F. I'm only saying that because it really struck me today that every second piece I saw had the notes written beneath it and not just for the start, for the whole thing. Um, that's not music literacy. So that, yeah, that was interesting. All right, so before we, um, got further into this piece, we might sing the scale. So to sing the scale, we might just sing it together in so far. I will try to use my hand signs and stick them in front of the camera, but the hand signs actually should be, the do should be at your belly button um, and you should place them going up according to pitch until you get up to high do. I'm just gonna stick them here so you can see them. So they would sing do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. I would get them to sing any letter names. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, B, A, G, F, E, D, C. My daughter told me something really good the other day. She was having trouble getting to sleep, so she was practicing the alphabet backwards and she suddenly went, oh, that's really good for music. Being able to sing in letter names backwards and don't ever let them say it. Get them to sing it, why not? It's gonna help them. Now, of course, this is an octave higher than what I just sang, but you can sing the whole thing. Do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re, do, re, so, fa, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re, do, mi, so, mi. <gasps> Tonic triad. Re, so, fa, re, ti, so, so, ti, re, fa, re, ti, so. It's a dominant seventh outlined here. Do, mi, so, mi, re, so, fa, re, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, do the scale, the octave. Now, this has two treble clefs, so nice and easy for people who don't like reading bass clef, but look at this. C, E, what chord are we outlining? The tonic triad. What note's missing? The dominant. Do, mi, so. 
What about this one? So T Fa. Now, what did we talk about down here? So T Fa, So T Re Fa Re T So. Dominant seventh. Churney's been really boring and just gone chord one, chord five, seven, chord one, chord five, seven, chord one, five, one, five, one, and finished. As we were talking before, why don't they try to make up a melody to go with those chords? Let them have a little play. Maybe the, all they do is turn the scale backwards. It's descending instead of ascending. But wow, they've created something of their own. Over here is what we call a tone ladder. And I love these because they're subconscious reinforcement of everything we know about these notes. For example, me to far is a semitone. T to do is a semitone and so on. Okay, this one's in F major. So down here, you can see that I've got the F major scale. And I'm not going to sing the whole scale simply because I don't like singing that high. What I am going to do is have a look at this little um, melody here. Now, this is the sort of thing that I know um, some singing teachers use as a little warm up. It's fun for choirs and things. Just be really careful when you get to the letter F, though. You have to be very careful. I'm not going to show you the whole video today. Um, but this is the sort of thing that I could ask my students to sight read and I would ask them to sight read it because it is incredibly scalic, sorry, incredibly chordal and it's logical chordal. So we begin on so, which is a bit unusual, but don't forget the first note can be whatever we want. So do me, so do me. Great. Tonic triad, just in a different inversion. Wow, it's a sixth four chord. Figured bass. Re, 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 ti, so, so, ti, re, ti, so, dominant triad. Re, 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 do, re, mi, do, so, do, don, tonic triad again. Mi, re, mi, fa, re, do. Such a simple melody. And yet there's already stuff we can talk about harmonically, melodically, tonally within that. And then, of course, let them have a little bit of fun. B A B B E B B I Bicky by B O Bo Bicky by Bo B U Boo Bicky by Bo Boo C A C C E C C I Sicky Sai C O So Sicky Sai So C U Su Sicky Sai So Su. Get the idea, girls? Now we'll all join together on the letter D. And like I said, I'll stop before we get to the F. Um, those of you of my generation might know that that was the Three Stooges. Um, and just be careful when you play their stuff because it is very, very, very sexist and it may offend. But um, there's an example of a perfect opportunity where so far, so much easier to sing than the words. So as an instrumental teacher, what other sorts of things you can do? Well, obviously you should sing the scales. Now we sing them in solfa. Solfa is easy. Solfa, every major scale has the same solfa, but we also sing them in letter names. I don't sing all keys in letter names unless we're learning a piece in it. Singing letter names always sing at pitch and that can be a bit challenging. Now, this is an example of how my students and I might go about this. Um, this is an activity and I'll show you where it comes from shortly, but this is an activity that we would work through together in order to sing the, the major scale. And this is basically just me singing it so that they, when they go home, have something to hang on to. Ready, do, re, mi, fa, so. Okay, here's another activity, and this is the letter name one. Now, again, it comes with a video. Major scales, G major in letter names. One, two, ready, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, F, E, D, C, B, A, G. And 
one of the things we won't have time to talk a lot about today are these little tiny steps. But the steps are designed so that at each step they have success. I do want to focus on the fourth step here, which says repeat step three, which is just sing the scale in letter names, reading the notation of the scale without sound. Step four is do the same thing again, descending, then ascending, inner hearing every third note. This is the beginning of the inner hearing or audiation that I mentioned before. Do, T, so, Fa, Re, Do, Re, Fa, So, T, Do. To do what I just did, you have to hear the missing notes in your head. You actually have to hear them being sung by yourself in your head so that the next note is still in tune. Don't expect your students to immediately be able to um, inner hear everything. You need to train their inner hearing. You may need to train your own as well. So why is inner hearing so important? On my website, if you search for the words inner hearing, you'll find quite a few articles about it. But it's basically thinking sound. And it's a just it's such an important part of what we do. And yet I think we, we've lost it quite a lot in traditional music teaching. So when you have time, you are most welcome to look at those. Um, as Kodai said, we should read music in the same way that an educated adult will read a book in silence, but imagining the sound. Okay, we should also practice, of course, playing scales. Now, I am not a fan of the technical side of the AMEB exams because to me, it's imposed. I actually like the VCE technical stack and this is more or less what it is now, um, but I like the fact the students need to look at the works they're performing and practicing and practice the technical work that is associated with those works. So I don't ever expect my students to play E flat major unless they're doing a work that's in E flat major. So if we think back to that Vivaldi piece, my students would be working on A minor, C major and C minor. And then we would be doing things like the arpeggios because they were really important in the piece. If they were doing a piece that had lots of double stopping and it was in E flat major, well, then we would do double stopping in E flat major. I think this whole music literacy thing ties in beautifully with technical work if it's relevant to the pieces that they're working on. And of course, you've seen me do a bit of this, recognizing the relevant scales visually, etc. Now, I'm very aware of the time, so I'm just going to skip through a bit, but um, you can sing as much as possible preferably in tonic solfa. Any little excerpts of what they're playing, if you look at it and you think, oh, that's nice and easy to sing, then sing it. And I just want to give you, um, actually, no, I'm going to skip through that. Apologies. <laughs> I never, ever know how long my talks are going to take. I want to show you this one because this takes the level of tonality to the melody. So up until now, we've talked about tonality as being a scale. Now we're talking about a melody. This is an example of an activity from the course that I'm going to tell you about in a minute. You can see all of these steps and the purpose of these steps is to get them to be able to sing this melody, which is in a minor key out loud. Minor melody. Minor melody one in E minor in solfa beginning on la one two three ready la do ti do ti la do you get the idea okay tonality study visual and oral analysis of works what about rhythm well yes you can tap and speak preferably using rhythm names there's an activity example here, which I'm not going to play now because I'm going to speed through, but you can see how it's already been begun with the rhythm names and the video of me doing it is me reading the rhythm names. Don't forget the value of if you're a string player or a pianist, 
performing the rhythm of the excerpt that's tricky just on a single note or as a wind player breathe the rhythmic pattern like take away what's complicated and let them focus on the bit they're not great at harmony you'll notice as i talk i refer i refer to everything in the correct music terminology when i sing i use solfa when i read rhythms i use rhythm names when i talk about notes i'm going to use their proper names this is just an example here you can see this is singing the scale in solfa with hand signs using the upper tonic so these are the kinds of terminologies that I use. So this is singing a melodic minor scale. La, ti, do, re, mi, fi, si, la, so, fa, mi, re, do, ti, la. But putting the upper tonic in between every note as a pedal point. La, la, ti, la, do, la, re, la, and so on. So this is a great example of giving them info like proper academic information but turning it into a practical activity what about harmony well you've heard me sing chords you could sing them um extract them from the piece and sing them or sing them in the piece there is an activity there about the same thing again i'm just going to skip through this now okay so what can you do toscanini said Instrumentalists, now Toscanini, one of the most famous ever conductors, instrumentalists can best interpret a work if they sing it to themselves first. He was talking about professional musicians in orchestras. Make singing a regular feature of every lesson, but it's not the singing that's the point. Get them to sing the tuning note before you let them play it. If they can't sing it in tune, they're not hearing it in tune. In a here, simple sight reading things, get them to begin sight singing. The sight reading follows so much more easily. Memorize, memorize using inner hearing. So many ideas there and so many ideas here because what I want to do is very quickly, I am absolutely positive there are some of you going, how do I get better at this stuff myself? Because if you're going to teach it, if you're going to use it, then you actually want it inside you too. And this is something that I'm really excited about. So I'm just going to show you very, very quickly. This is the musicianship module of the Music Language Online course. And this is what I wanted when I first discovered Solfa. This is not for beginners. This is for musicians. This is for people who already know what a scale is, but maybe can't sing it in Solfa or not well. This is for people who know what a crotchet is, but don't know how to read it while they conduct. This is, like I said, this is what I wanted and I wished I'd had it 26 years ago. Um, what's on the screen now is um, only for you guys. That is a coupon code that if you did want to buy the course, the course is $40. If you use that coupon code, it'll be 20 bucks. <laughs> and that's for you and your students. So it, it will expire in a couple of weeks, but. I'm just, yeah, I hate selling. I like helping, but I have to make a living. Um, so the whole point of the course is to teach you as a musician to be even more musically literate than you are now. It's to strengthen your musicianship skills. It's just to give you that whole deeper understanding. It give, will give you ideas on how to practice things. And I don't mean just for musicianship, it's fascinating that the more you go into this way of teaching and practicing the tiniest little bits hundreds and hundreds of times without getting bored will give you ideas for how to practice things on the instrument. And of course, it uses all the tools that I've talked about because my goal for my students is to make them truly musically independent. I want them to be able to use music however they want when they leave my hallowed halls and go out into the greater world. I want them to be able to be a session muso and somebody hand them a sheet, whether it's, you know, a chord chart or a, a staff notation or, you know, I want them to be musically literate in every way possible. 
So as always, I am here. If money is a problem for you or your students, please always let me know because I'm very open to helping as much as I can. And to finish, of course, there has to be a quote from Zoltan Karai. To teach a child an instrument without first giving them preparatory training and without developing singing, reading and dictating to the highest level along with the playing is to build upon sand. Kevin, 